Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the History and Memory in International Relations Conference. We will begin with keynote lecture by Professor Beata Ochepka, whom you have already heard yesterday um, as a commentator of the first panel on theory. Um, but let me introduce her again. Uh, Professor Ochepka um, uh, teaches uh, uh, international relations and international communication and is head of the public diplomacy lab at the Institute for International Studies, the University of Wrocław, Poland. Um, she has also served as chair of the section of communication and public relations at the University of Warsaw. And she was also chair in political science at the Willy Brandt Center for German and European Studies at the University of Wrocław and director of the Institute of International Studies at the same university. She's head of the International Communication Section of the Polish Association for International Studies. Uh, Professor Ochepka specializes in public and cultural diplomacy and international political communication research. Uh, she's currently member of the Political Science Committee of the Polish Academy of Sciences for the um, term 2023. She's the author of about 150 works, including the book Poland's New Ways of Public Diplomacy. Uh, and her most recent publication is uh, it's, uh, in German, Poland's Public Diplomacy, Deutschlands Auswärtige Kulturpolitik und die Gemeinsamen Beziehungen. So Polish Public Diplomacy, uh, the German uh, Foreign uh, Cultural Politik, Politik and, um, uh, and relations between those. Professor Ociepka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will only add to this uh, introduction, which I'm very thankful for, that uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a political scientist with double specialization, and uh, it will be visible also in my uh, today's um, talk. Uh, so, well, um, maybe I will start with uh, the idea that yesterday we illustrated the many links and clashes uh, between um, history and international relations. With one exception, uh, we didn't... Um, discuss uh, the simple fact that there is a sense of controversy or uh, competition between history and social sciences and international relations political science as uh, social sciences disciplines. Uh, much has been said, by the way, about the uh, existence or not the existence of international relations as a discipline or wider political science in relation to history. And this topic was also discussed uh, by authors like Koliopoulos or Schroeder, uh, who tried also to illustrate uh, how I history um, actually impacts uh, the methodology of international relations. So I'm talking about it because uh, such debates has been permanently present in Poland's social sciences of the last 30 years. And it's one of the factors, variables, which uh, shapes also my uh, today's presentation, I think. However, today um, I will mainly discuss what history means in international relations, first and foremost in practice, um, as in the conduct, such as in the conduct of foreign uh, policy. Uh, the title, as you see, um, indicates the focus on international relations, as the notion is wider uh, than foreign policy, and it allows me to include non-state actors into the current um, current analysis. So, well, uh, the main incentive to present the study uh, stems from the effects of my research on uh, public diplomacy as a tool of uh, foreign policy and one of the forms of external political communication of states. Uh, I often go back to the probably um, shortest, but at the same time, uh, universal definitions of uh, public diplomacy, which was uh, coined by Cynthia Schneider, a uh, United States diplomat and academic who defined the latter as um, all a nation wants to tell about itself to the world. Uh, such an approach uh, to public diplomacy pushes the student to think on narratives which nat nations develop to gain international recognition, to strive for prestige, but also to strengthen the international security. Uh, so I would like to stress that although public diplomacy is usually seen as a tool of soft power and framed by approaches mainly from liberal school of international relations, even if Nye defined himself as a liberal realist, um, 
Well, it can also serve objectives of security of state, which is a core idea of a hard power concept. So the fact that my studies from the last 20 years ended up in the inclusion of the so-called politics of memory of some countries, such as Poland, to the core elements of a public diplomacy explains my idea to share some findings of my studies related to this effect in this talk. Uh, I have also to explain that I use the notion politics of memory, uh, which is actually uh, the effect of the decision taken together with the uh, translators or people who simply helped me to correct my English. Uh, whereas it is not only the best solution, especially if we focus on, uh, on the Polish case. So my focus on history and international relations stems from my research on Poland and especially on the ways Polish state and non-state actors communicate with international partners, first and foremost with Germany, Ukraine and Russia. And the exit point for Polish governments representing all the sides of Poland's political landscape, by the way, campaigns for foreigners, is the slogan that you can't know Poland unless you have some knowledge um, about Polish history. It was, uh, the way to get the knowledge about the country is to get accustomed with its history and, as it can be expected, in the version told by the government. Uh, the focus on public uh, diplomacy has also more advantages, in my opinion, as it places the study within the public sphere as a space where public opinion formation uh, takes uh, place. So it allows to include the phenomena such as uh, media and communication, political culture and socialization process into the analysis. Um, let me only uh, stress that uh, it allows also to include the cognitive, emotional and the behavioral uh, components of political culture. And of course, the knowledge about history and emotions it evokes are essential to understand its role in politics, also in foreign policy. Still, I will focus on foreign policy as the instrument of governments to shape international relations and on foreign policy analysis as a method to understand its logics and its domestic dimension. In line with foreign policy analysis, political culture and public opinion belong to the factors shaping foreign policy decisions. Uh, they reflect the place and relevance of history and its comprehension in the political culture of the country. Public diplomacy is an instrument of foreign policy and as such is shaped by the same factors, political culture and public opinion among them. Uh, what is more, uh, public diplomacy comprises the thrilling idea of the impact of the public, the citizens and non-state organizations on foreign policy and directs the attention to the public sphere and the space of public opinion, of public opinion formation. Mm, I will present here on the uh, slides also the definitions, wider definitions of both phenomena, I mean public diplomacy and the new public diplomacy, as nowadays, uh, at least in my uh, subfield of international relations, we rather use the idea of the new public diplomacy. The focus uh, on the field allows also to include some knowledge from media and communication uh, studies and from public relations. Uh, also, these uh, fields reflect on the role of history in international relations. Uh, public relations theory focused on intercultural communication, um, which is of course relevant for creating sound public relations campaigns abroad, tells us that some nations are more oriented on the past, whereas some are more oriented on the future. And the communication between the representatives of these two diversely oriented groups of nations or states might be disturbed if we don't realize the difference. This is what actually what happens quite often in public diplomacy, and this is the reason of many disturbances in Central European countries' communication with other partners in Europe and in the world. As the consequence, actors of international relations ignore each other's messages and narratives as they do not listen to the other side. They do not listen to, other, to the other side line of argumentation. And as you can expect, uh, we have many illustrations from last months. And here, of course, comes the citation from Ursula von der Leyen um, from her September talk citation, we should have listened to the voices inside our union in Poland, in the Baltics, and all across Central and Eastern Europe, they have been telling us for years 
but Putin would not stop. End of citation. Uh, so, well, um, my talk today is to much extent focused on Central Europe and Poland, of course, because Central Europe means the ubiquity of history for many authors, not only historians, but also people from international relations uh, studies. So instead of listening, what we um, faced in last years was labeling countries like Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, um, labeling their approach to Russia as um, obsession with history, which resulted in the labels like new Cold War warriors or anti-Russian EU neophytes. Uh, so this process of not listening was also uh, found also uh, illustration reviewed within the academia, and in 2022 um, was named was planning. Uh, the, the authors of an article published as a reaction to the second phase of Russian aggression in Ukraine understand it as uh, ignoring citation Eastern European history and the perspective of the Eastern Europeans. Uh, the article was published as a reaction to a debate on Twitter where many academics exchanged their opinions and shared more examples on West Planning. Uh, West Planning, uh, in the uh, meanwhile, turned to a, to a hashtag. And uh, on Twitter, it was possible to follow uh, the discussion in which the uh, users of Twitter started to present very cases of West Planning. And one of uh, Czech uh, professors of mathematics and informatics working at one of the French uh, universities I presented such an example. My memorable one is from France when I arrived from Czechia and have been told by a French leftist friend that I cannot understand what communism is because I grew up in it. The end of citation. So, whereas the article on West Planning by uh, Smolensky and Dudkiewicz, as they were the authors, presented West Planning first and foremost as a trend of a realist school in international relations, and usually focused on the US and US perspectives on international developments, and the uh, leftist colleagues or leftist uh, political movements were presented as the second um, reason for West Planning, the users of Twitter would rather stick to the leftist experiences or to the experiences with the leftist colleagues or commentators. Um, so I started a kind of non-systematic pilot study on the tweets and uh, I realized that um, the users of Twitter who commented on West Planning, um, they, uh, they, uh, they were approached by uh, the other users or uh, previously uh, by their colleagues uh, who were willing to correct the Central Eastern European perceptions based on history which, which they took actually for false because of a direct participation or engagement of Central and Eastern European people in some historical developments. So it, it looked as if being a witness of history excluded the possibility to, to evaluate its relevance. This observation, uh, as I knew, of course, that we are going also to discuss oral history here, this observation added, um, for me, some ambiguity to the studies on oral history. Uh, of although, on the one hand, I'm far from ignoring the, uh, the oral history uh, studies as a primary source in any research, um, but on the other, the discussion on Twitter showed that, the, that we are prone to ignore other people's narratives. In this case, the question is if it is once again the location in Central Europe which results in the invisibility of narratives or ignoring the experiences of the people who would like to share the, to share the oral histories. Uh, I think that this debate on West Planning revealed the assumption of the non-central European interlocutors that the participation in some historical developments deprives the participants from the right to understand them in a rational way. And this problem of rationality and emotionality uh, is also well reflected in, on the higher level in foreign policy, also in the context between politicians or simply in diplomacy and in public uh, diplomacy. Um, so the same emotionality seemed to be one of the elements ascribed to Central Europe in relations with Russia. And it was confronted with the rational West. The emotional East rooted its line of reasoning in negative emotions stemming from the past traumas, whereas the rational West was able to look towards the future. Um, 
to build on partnership in business and trade and um, and it was also supported by public and cultural diplomacy uh, programs. So I want to suggest a hypothesis in this stu study saying that the actors of international relations often do not realize that there is a difference in the role history plays in their foreign policy and consequently in the ways they imagine its impact on international relations. Uh, I intentionally uh, speak here of the imagination of if the impact on international relations. Uh, for some of them, history is the roadmap for the foreign policy. For some, a still relevant context, but belonging just to many domestic variables influencing the process of decision taking in foreign policy. I will suggest that Central European countries' history plays the role of the roadmap, and it will not be any surprise that I will argue that the fact is rooted in the approach to geopolitics and results from the small or mid-sized actors' limited hard power resources and in the ways how they understand their identities as nations and the international identity of their states. Consequently, the same geopolitics as a variable makes great powers, original great powers, to understand history as a context. Also, however, both types of actors would use politics of memory if necessary in their foreign uh, policy. Using history as a context doesn't automatically say that great powers are future-oriented. Mm, well, I used a, uh, an indicator called Future Orientation Index, which was uh, developed, uh, has been developed actually since uh, about 2011. And this Future Orientation Index says that it is essential to consider the well-being of the society in the estimation how relevant the past or future orientation will be in the political culture of the country and consequently in its relevance for foreign policy decision taking. In line with this future orientation index in 2012, um, Germany was future oriented and it was the first on the list of about 50 countries uh, which the study was focused on. Poland, Russia and Ukraine were definitely focused on the past. Poland was the 35th on the list, Russia 37, Ukraine 42. However, this indicator doesn't directly say that the nation's countries found history as relevant. Uh, however, with the combination with well-being of the states, gives some uh, ideas about the political culture and the impact of the past or future orientation for the people living in, this, uh, in these countries. Uh, the future uh, orientation index, when it was actually presented for the first time was very, very simple uh, because it uh, was based on what people search on Google simply. Uh, if they search for, um, it was done in 2012, so if they search for 2013, uh, they were future-oriented, whereas when they search for 2011, they were past-oriented. But this was how the study was actually launched and of course it has been developed since then. There are also uh, of course, the other developments and the other events which contribute to more past orientation in foreign policy. And in the case of Russia, Russian authors uh, would say that it is the consequence of the conservative turn uh, about 2012-2013. But we heard also yesterday in the talk by uh, Professor George Mink, who I think gave more insight into the Russian case. And we know, of course, that also in the Russian case, uh, I wouldn't call history only a context in the country's um, foreign policy. Uh, my second hypothesis uh, of this uh, study is that public diplomacy process is a good illustration for the use of history in foreign policy and international relations as a context or as a roadmap. Uh, so knowledge about history resulting from the socialization process contributes to the formation of political culture and consequently influences public opinion process and this is one of the paths how the domestic factors shape foreign policy. The whole process called intermestic dimension of foreign policy is usually presented as a transmission of internal domestic values and objectives into foreign policy. And well, uh, in line with uh, the authors of the intermestic Mm, uh, concept of uh, mm, Kegley, Witkopf uh, and uh, Katsovic, the notion of intermestic means the merger of international and domestic domains. As a result, governmental agencies in fields such as public diplomacy mediate between the forces of globalization 
and with domestic stakeholders while playing the role of a transmission belt. In public diplomacy, they transmit the core messages based on narratives that are constitutive, constitutive for national identity. The fact that Poland's efforts in public diplomacy and country branding and the understanding of how the country is perceived abroad have been one of the bones of contention between the main political forces affects in the country the conduct of public diplomacy to a significant extent. And if history is a core element of the political culture of past-oriented nations, the narratives will be also focused on history as public diplomacy embraces narratives the nation wants to tell about itself to the world, as Cynthia uh, Schneider uh, would say. So I come back to her definition once, uh, once again. Uh, so uh, I think... And I will explain also why Poland uh, is here a good example, not only because, of course, it's easier for me to do the research on the Polish case as the citizen of Poland, although I think that the fact that I'm citizen of Poland disturbs as much as it helps. Um, so I find here many, uh, much evidence uh, for the use of history uh, in foreign policy and international relations. Uh, just as one example, you're familiar with uh, Institut Pamięci Narodowej, Institut of National Remember, Remembers, which uh, takes part uh, in many projects uh, of Polish public diplomacy and politics of memory. Uh, for example, uh, this institution takes part in the campaign We Are Telling the World About Poland, which sounds as a direct citation from Cynthia Schneider. Um, well, this makes me to include uh, I on R uh, to the current uh, study. So in public diplomacy, the narratives are sent as messages to the external public's users of media. There is, however, no guarantee uh, how they will be decoded, the messages, uh, by uh, the possible participants or users, users. So to achieve success in public diplomacy process, uh, its partners have to share the same code of communication. Central Europe, in this context, um, is a suitable space to select the illustrations of many clashing narratives. And once again, we had yesterday already many examples of such clashing nar narratives in Central Europe. The misunderstandings result from barriers in communication, many of them deeply rooted in contradictions in the understanding or presenting the past events. In a perfect world, these misunderstandings would be analyzed and the effects of the study would be used for the improvement of any public diplomacy strategies. In public diplomacy, feedback is relevant and the process leads to hybridization, suggesting that both or all participants of the process should expect changes in their behavior, their identity, uh, even in their identity as a result of the interaction. In the context of history, it means that if partners of public diplomacy realize that the misunderstandings result from how they comprehend or present the common history, they will focus on a search for a solution, also in their own approaches, attitudes, values. In public diplomacy, such processes take much time and may involve partners, also non-state actors of international relations. Textbook commissions, commissions are a good illustration of such efforts, but also the European Network, Remembrance and Solidarity the Organizer, of this conference. So, well, uh, I have to stress the, that the European network is also included into the study as the actor of international relations and actor of public diplomacy. The inclusion of this actor gives the project a touch of Luhmann's self-reference. Uh, in this sense, we can ask the question what history and international relation understands as environment and the same effect affects the actors taking decisions in foreign policy. So in this talk, I focus on the new public um, diplomacy. And you already uh, saw the longish uh, definition of the new uh, public um, uh, diplomacy. Um, and its reflection or its use, its implementation in Central Europe and by Central Europe. Um, and actually, it's a complex phenomenon because, as in many other regions, uh, new public diplomacy in the region means inclusion of non-state organizations, institutions, and companies as actors, which sounds as uh, acceptance of some ideas of liberalism. But, of course, uh, in this region, uh, NPD is shaped by 
security objectives of the countries and by geopolitics. We are going back to realism. Uh, last but not least, uh, public diplomacy in Central and Europe links the narratives with the identity of the people and very constructivist idea of the international identity of the states. It covers, of course, also cultural diplomacy. Maybe it's not uh, um, very evident because uh, there are different approaches, but in Central Europe, uh, cultural diplomacy turned to the uh, element of public diplomacy. And it's understood in a cosmopolitan way as a tool which serves uh, mainly for the understanding international relations. And it clashes very often with the, uh, with the objectives of politics of memory, which is the core element of public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy uh, in the region. Because uh, politics of memory in the region is shaped in line with imagination of a sending country, which uh, in many cases means telling the truth of the governments or of the incumbent parties, and it may end up in uh, propaganda. And I have to declare that I don't represent the school which equates uh, public diplomacy with propaganda. I represent the school which says that public diplomacy is a win-win game in international relations. If we are not able to implement it as a win-win game, then we should simply go back to the old good traditional propaganda. So, uh, politics of memory is the core of public diplomacy in the region, not only here, but I work mainly on this case. So we have the past-oriented nations, which create strategies of public diplomacy with, pub with politics on memory as the core. Uh, even the nation branding uh, efforts are shaped by narratives on history, and it was well illustrated uh, in the campaigns uh, at the turn of the 20th and 21st century, which illustrated the process of coming back uh, to Europe. Uh, politics of, of memory turned to the core element um, for, first and foremost, mid-sized and small countries, uh, those deprived of hard power um, assets. Uh, it's visible, what is more, practically in the programs of uh, the main political parties in the region, uh, and it doesn't matter if they are left-wing, uh, right-wing, uh, liberal, or uh, more um, conservative. The reason for the popularity of politics of memory within the strategies of public and cultural uh, cultural diplomacy, but also nation branding in Central and Eastern Europe, is so. Uh, so among them, there is the exclusion of these countries' narratives from the mainstream of historic of historical narratives in Europe before 1989, and the importance of history for their cultural um, identity. In Poland, we can see uh, the uh, birth of uh, the first efforts. Uh, but more institutionalized, institutionalized effort for public diplomacy about 24 and 25. This is when actually the, uh, the first institutions were established or simply renamed because before the countries also invested both in politics on, of memory and promotion of the countries, but they hardly used the idea of public and cultural diplomacy. In the region, um, Public diplomacy is seen as the, as the agenda of the state, um, but the effects of research on public diplomacy and branding say that the so-called ordinary individuals, and public diplomacy would call them citizen diplomats, at least in Poland, joined the public diplomacy network via social media in the most controversial cases. And one of the most controversial cases and examples um, was the uh, campaign against the so-called defect, uh, defective codes of memory. Uh, with the uh, most uh, striking uh, illustration, which was the campaign against Polish concentration camps, about, against the use of the notion Polish uh, concentration camps. So, uh, the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs introduced this idea of defective codes of memory and I think this idea needs explanation because it was introduced by the ministry and by the authors who at the time when it was introduced 
uh, not only published a report on this uh, defective codes of memory, but um, one of them was also Novak Far was also vice minister of Polish uh, of, of Poland, of foreign uh, vice minister in foreign ministry of Poland. Uh, so, uh, in line with the public diplomacy report for 2015 2016, uh, Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs ha had been actively and in cooperation with academics um, struggling against, uh, the, uh, against the use of the terms as uh, citation Polish concentration uh, camps. And we were working citation on the issue on the deflective codes of memory emerging in press and political discourse. Thus, periodically, the Poland's Department of Public and Cultural Diplomacy within the Poland's Foreign Ministry would focus first and foremost on politics of memory. The next step in this respect was the legal intervention in the form of the amendment of the law of the Institute of uh, National Remembrance, which led to a well-known scandal in 2018 and from the perspective of Poland's politics of memory, public diplomacy and nation branding turned to a catastrophe, achieving the effect opposite to the expectations. So politics of memory might be seen as both governmental and non-governmental actors' attempts to influence messages on history that are sent abroad and to control them, in line with uh, Foucault's uh, understanding of relationships between discourse and power. Poland's efforts in politics of memory reflect the Polish governments, but also communities of citizens, which were illustrated in the last 20 years by, uh, 15 years, by social media issue alliances. So it reflects the conviction that messages focused on history might be shaped so as to present the dominating in Poland version, it means that of the incumbent party. Politics of memory reflects the narratives of dominating discourses. Um, so they form the foundations for cultural educational science policy as, um, as such they find reflection in official celebrations and stage events. They feed from cultural policy of the country and they contribute to the formation of the cultural policy of the country. And as actors of international relations and the programming hubs for politics of memory, governments can promote pluralism and include opposing views while supporting NGOs as partners in politics of memory or can do the opposite that is, exclude any opposing views while supporting only organizations and communities that represent the same dominating messages. So, uh, the latter process might be seen as an element of a transition from liberal democracy to neo-authoritarian rule, and this is exactly what has been happening in Poland since 2015 and 2016. So, there is a trend to control the discourse on history in past-oriented uh, system. Uh, this is how, by the way, I understand the role of Polish Institute of National Remembers, Remembers which was included into Polish uh, politics of memory also. Uh, so these processes were also illustrated um, by foreign um, Polish uh, foreign ministers as I interviewed. Uh, some of them, and uh, I analyzed also the memoirs of some of them, and uh, I found a very good reflection on uh, how history worked in um, Polish foreign policy, policy, especially in relations with the neighbors in the 90s, in, uh, in the uh, writings uh, by Stefan Meller, who was uh, a Polish foreign minister between 25 and 26, but also was uh, involved uh, before in uh, poly Polish foreign policy. And he um, identified uh, the history as a minefield in relations between, um, between ni nations, especially if these nations um, are about to, negoci to negotiate um, bilateral, bilateral agreements. And he illustrated the role of uh, history in Polish-Russian uh, negotiations with uh, his opinion, uh, citation, um, we hit them with a ribbentrop molotov pact and they respond by elaborating on the Polish-German non-aggression pact and its effects, which called for Polish-German collaboration on the division of, of Czechoslovakia. We targeted them with the 17th September 1939 and they answer that it was because of the insecurity caused by Hitler so they had to shorten their borders. So 
a pie of an elephant and a lark half in half, and this all very dem demagogic. Uh, so this citation illustrates, I think, how the negotiations looked mainly in the 90s. However, we find um, much of such examples. Meller himself would speak also of the negotiations with Lithuania, uh, which were very much um, which were actually vulnerable to controversy arising from the common history. Uh, there were battles of memory and um, permanent media wars between Poland and Germany in the 90s, and um, they practically can be observed even today. Uh, these memory battles and um, the conflicts with... Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able, I don't know why, to show you the illustration here. <laughs> I have it on my... I don't know why. Oh, it's a pity. Okay, because I wanted to illustrate the memory battles um, also in the field of sport between Poland and Germany. Uh, in 2006, um, uh, there was the uh, World Cup in Germany, and at the time, the uh, Polish tabloid press attacked the, uh, let's say, the German football team, uh, claiming they, uh, they of course, would not never win uh, in any match with Poland, and they started to present uh, the German uh, uh, football team as dressed in uh, the Teutonic Order coats. This is a very strong symbol uh, in Poland, these white coats with uh, black crosses. And even they were wearing uh, the Prussian um, pickle hauba was the name, I think. Uh, the Dutch uh, coach of the Polish team at the time was presented as the Polish king, uh, Jagiełło, uh, who was one of the very few Polish kings who was able to enjoy the victory over Germany, as in 1410, Poland won a battle with Teutonic Order. Uh, and if this was actually presented on the first page of uh, the most popular tabloid press in 2006, fact, this was very anti-German, based on uh, all the symbols uh, every child in Poland at the time knew, and I think even today they would be um, understandable because of the efforts of public service broadcasters in Poland even nowadays. Um, the uh, strange thing behind it was that the newspaper, the tabloid uh, media outlet which did it, belonged at that time to Springer. Uh, so it looked as if uh, the press run by a uh, German press uh, editor in Poland attacked Germany using all the uh, stereotypes and the symbols from the past. With no good effects, of course, because first of all, Poland lost the match with Germany immediately, very quickly, and the whole campaign was very quickly silenced. And what is more, Springer didn't achieve any, uh, practically any uh, success also in selling fact, because I, I checked it at the time, uh, even the daily uh, numbers of sold copies were available and there was practically no difference in how many copies they sold uh, during 26 uh, anti-German uh, campaign. So, well, this was the impact and inv involvement of media into the whole process, which is relevant because uh, media can be seen, of course, as intermediaries only in public diplomacy, but they can also uh, function as uh, actors of uh, public diplomacy. And in Central Europe, we have very interesting cases as this one. So we have the press, which is run by uh, German owners, which present anti-German stereotypes and actually contribute a lot to the um, Polish-German tensions, which are very easy to be, to be evoked. So, as you see, I focus here in my talk mainly on the Polish side and how uh, politics of memory was included into Polish uh, public and cultural diplomacy. And the process has been very long, uh, meant the inclusion of many actors. Uh, so, the last example were the uh, actors from, from the media. And this PowerPoint, although I don't think it's uh, readable, but to some extent at least, uh, presents uh, some chronology uh, so that we understand better what actually happened 
so it starts about 1989 uh, because uh, actually at that time, of course, Poland would uh, implement um, politics of memory, but with no uh, coherent strategies. The first strategies appear between 24 and 25. In 25, the leading Polish political parties agree that politics of memory is the essential part of the promotion of the country and uh, the oppositional today uh, citizens platform includes politics of memory as the core of foreign policy. So at least we have uh, evidence in programs of main political parties how they understand politics of memory and that they see politics of memory as the core element of Poland's promotion abroad and of Polish uh, foreign uh, policy. Uh, there are also very visible signs of institutionalization of uh, politics of memory by Poland and, well, uh, it starts practically with the establishment of Institute of National Remembrance in 98, established mainly for the internal purposes and then engaged in external campaigns um, also last years. In the case of I and R, the statutory tasks uh, don't mention directly any active role of organization in public diplomacy, but a closer look at the campaigns and publications of the Institute allow to include it into Poland's actors of public diplomacy and politics of memory, of course. And one of the tasks mentions, uh, mentioned by the law from 1998 gives IPN, or INR, directly the right to intervene in any case which is classified as negatively influencing Poland's reputation. It means that um, the Institute works both at the domestic and external levels of Poland's uh, public diplomacy while educating about history in the country and sharing documentation and knowledge about it abroad. IPN has uh, history points in Belgium, Belarus, Czech Republic, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, USA and Great Britain. They are core organizers of the Days of Polish Heritage abroad. So the formalization of uh, politics of memory in Poland, formalization and institutionalization uh, happened in Poland about 2004. So at the same time when Poland joined the European Union. And at the same time Poland started to react on the misuse on the infamous term Polish concentration camps, while by the way involving not only government but also non-governmental actor, which was a Polish press at that time, even if the media outlet which reacted as the first still had some uh, shares owned by a po Polish Ministry of uh, Treasure. Uh, the, in the last years we have the new institutions which were added to the network of Polish public cultural diplomacy and politics of memory. And one of the most representatives in this sense is Pilecki Institute, established in 2017 in Poland and then its branch in Berlin in established in 2019. Pilecki Institute is supposed to uh, tell the stakeholders about the uh, mainly the history and the totalitarianisms of the 20th century. And this is the main idea, to remove the barriers in uh, communication while telling the history from the perspective uh, in this case of, of Poland. So the next part of my talk would be to um, to provide you with some illustrations from Polish-Russian relations, uh, good and bad effects of uh, politics of memory on both sides, and the same in the Polish-German case. Um, but I think I don't have as much time to, to go into details. I would like only to stress the relevance of one initiative, which was mentioned already yesterday uh, by uh, um, Professor George Pink, as he spoke about the uh, Polish-Russian um, group for difficult matters. I called it in such a way, I also discussed the name with uh, uh, some native speakers in English, and well, the Polish name of the group actually uh, sounds uh, not very good, and the same, I think, is in English, but uh, it has also some advantages, this name of this group, because it reflected that Polish and um, Russian governments uh, realized the impact of history on uh, bilateral relations and they uh, established the group in 2022 20 with the idea to discuss the most problematic issues of history which contributed to the tensions in uh, bilateral relations. And this group 
achieved no success between 2002 and 2007. One of the explanation was that at the time it was led by politicians, whereas in 2007, from 2007, it was led by former politicians uh, on the Polish side, Adam Rothfeld, um, former uh, foreign minister, and Torkunov, who uh, was not any politician at the time. And actually, between 2007 and 2013, this group achieved some success uh, because the historians on both sides started to cooperate and produced one of the basic books illustrating the main fields, minefields, as Meller would say, in Polish-Russian relations, which um, complicated the bilateral relations. Uh, they were, of course, uh, called the black holes or white holes in Polish-Russian uh, uh, history. However, as you can imagine, after 2014, this group couldn't practically operate, mainly because of the aggression on Russia on Ukraine in 2014, and eventually in 2015, uh, Adam Rothfeld resigned and this group hasn't achieved any further development. I think, yes, uh, tomorrow you have also a presentation by Ernest Wojciszkiewicz, who, who is also the director of Polish-Russian Center for Dialogue, the next institution which was established um, uh, by 2010, in the expectation that it is possible to reach some dialogue also on history between Poland and Russia and to build the bilateral relations in a more effective way. However, the same war in Ukraine, of course, uh, it served as a test, a kind of verification for the Poland's but mainly Central Eastern European obsessions, emotional approaches to Russia, but it destroyed also many previous efforts in public diplomacy. Wars usually uh, result in shrinking the spaces for public diplomacy because public diplomacy needs open media systems and open political systems. We are now confronted with more propaganda than public diplomacy, but of course politics of memory is very well reflected in propaganda and it's much easier, I would say, to uh, conduct uh, public uh, politics of memory as framed by propaganda than uh, by public diplomacy. In public diplomacy you have to to respect uh, the users, the stakeholders, the partners' views and opinions and to try at least to understand the reasons for these misunderstandings which result from the interpretation of history. So, as you see, I focus in this talk and I'm coming now to a conclusion mainly on Polish efforts on the institutionalization of public, uh, politics of memory within public and cultural diplomacy. And uh, with explanation why and in which way politics of memory turned to the core element of uh, Polish public and cultural diplomacy. This is why I would claim that it is also the core of some countries of Central Europe external political communication. It was, by the way, many times misused and brought the opposite effects to the expectations, as, for example, in the, in the 90s, where all the countries of the region would focus on the Yauta, and, well, nobody actually wanted to listen to these um, uh, explanations because it was simply too often used. What I was not talking about uh, was the other side's perspective, like the German, the Russian, and the Ukrainian. Uh, the Russian was, to some extent, um, explained by uh, George Mink yesterday. However, the German would be very interesting because we have here uh, a kind of a, um, attempt to avoid history as a roadmap, or um, maybe it's on some... Um, it's, the, it's the politics of memory which uh, was conducted for many years so that to avoid the inclusion of history into foreign policy. And there are very interesting uh, studies done um, on, for example, what the, uh, what the German um, foreign uh, cultural policy, because this is the term of Germany for what I call public diplomacy, uh, what was achieved and what was done uh, in the case of the US, where the German governments would invest a lot uh, to counter the initiatives like, for example, uh, or to counter the negative effects of initiatives like the Holocaust Memorial. So when in New York the idea to build the Holocaust Memorial was born, uh, the German uh, external foreign policy reacted with some ideas how to develop their own programs so that the 
Holocaust memorial messages would not dominate the relations of the US with Germany and especially the perception of the US citizens about Germany. And we have uh, the same preventive idea of politics of memory about 2013, just to give another example, when within the huge, by the way, department of uh, uh, foreign uh, cultural policy within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a section for the celebrations of the Great War was established. And this section was, of course, not to, to prepare at any ce uh, celebrations in Germany, but to counter or to prevent any um, damage to German, uh, to German uh, perception, to perceptions about Germany in the countries which were to celebrate the anniversaries which were linked to 20 and um, sorry to 20 and 14 and 20 and uh, 20 and 14 mainly uh, Great War anniversaries. And this section was of course ab uh, abolished after the uh, the celebrations were finished. But this is also the uh, the, the reactive. Uh, function, role of politics of memory, also in the countries which, as Germany would try not to see history as a roadmap, or it is a roadmap, but what to avoid actually in foreign, in foreign policy. The case of Ukraine is also, of course, very relevant when we analyze it from the Ukrainian perspective. Uh, I Actually, I did some research on it before 2015, and now, we, of course, we have to have another look because the situation of the country was changed to a large extent. I, I wouldn't expect that the frame as public and cultural diplomacy would be now a good uh, frame to, to analyze the Ukrainian case. Uh, because as I say, the war uh, usually uh, results in the shrinking spaces for public diplomacy, but of course it feeds a lot politics of memory, but used for the purposes of, of, uh, war, of war propaganda. Uh, so, well, I will finish here, uh, I think. Um, thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you so much for the brilliant lecture. And now I would like to invite asking questions. Okay, um, here we have three questions. We would need a micro. Four, who will give more? Um, Okay, Eric was the first, I believe. Hi, um, thanks so much for uh, Eric Langebacher from Georgetown University. Um, thanks for such a wide ranging and interesting um, talk. But um, I'd like to press you a little bit more on the Polish case. Um, it seems like you're taking a very balanced view in assessing the success of public diplomacy efforts. But um, um, I don't know, at least from the perspective of North America, uh, it doesn't come off as super successful. It comes off as very defensive. I mean, first, I mean, I get the Polish death camp um, thing, right? But then you didn't really mention the new libel law, the new, um, you know, thou shalt not talk about Polish complicity in any Holocaust-related crimes. And there was even a prosecution about that of two academics. So I was, that, that did not resonate very well abroad, if I could put it that way. And now, of course, there are the reparation demands against uh, Germany, with a lot of people in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere kind of raising an eyebrow and thinking, what? I mean, what's going on with that? So, I don't know. What does this say about public diplomacy, at least under this government? And, um, yeah, uh, I think maybe a, a more negative assessment might be in order. So maybe let's collect, like, three or four questions. Uh, so thank you, Professor Tomasz Cebulski from Krakow. Thank you, Professor, for, for those milestones. Uh, uh, isn't it a little bit of a problem that the application of history or memory in international relations is always a matter of time and audience? Because in my experience of, let's say, Polish-Israeli or Polish-Jewish relations, uh, we are spending long time, or even in the Commission for the Difficult Matters with Russia, we are spending a lot of time on building dialogue bridges and uh, having an audience who are usually academical, so intellectuals on both sides, and uh, such a capital that is built in a big effort of 10 years, 15 years, is all of the time, uh, is all of the time completely destroyed and damaged by a single statement 
of a single history undereducated politician who is capitalizing and weaponizing this history for his own short-term political benefits. So uh, that's one of the observations in applying memory and history in international relations. And my question is whether the new public diplomacy might be an answer to this problem. Because the new public diplomacy is using the new media, is using different channels of communication, kind of bypassing the formal agents constructing politics and constructing, uh, let's say, this formalized state memory level. So is the new public diplomacy kind of an answer to bypass the official channels and kind of mediate and build more of a dialogue-oriented policy? Okay, Felix. Okay, thank you very much for the questions, uh, for the <laughs> presentation and the questions <laughs> that already came. Um, I'm Felix Kravacek from the Center for East European and International Studies in Berlin. I've got a question about your definition of public diplomacy and propaganda, because it seems to me that the definition you adopt very much depends on the value judgment of the researcher, and that certainly can't be the case. And um, to take the last example that you gave about Germany's centenary and the way Germany tried to kind of um, frame the debate about the outbreak of the war, is that a case of propaganda? Because Germany was very outspoken about this, but on the other hand, the structural factors that you indicate about public diplomacy, diverse media landscape and so on, that all we have in Germany, and there was a very diverse debate about how Germany was engaging with the centenary. Um, to take a different example, what about the Gaiso law in France that kind of celebrates French colonial achievements in Africa? Is that part of public diplomacy because France is an excellent democracy? Or is that, democ is that propaganda because it's just um, kind of distorting history? Um, so, yeah, I would like to have some clarity about this definitional line. Um, and then building on what, what Eric was saying, you sound very much to embrace public diplomacy tainted by history. And I would like to turn that around a little bit, thinking about, I mean, what has actually been achieved over the last 20 years by bringing history into foreign policy and thinking about these demands for reparations, for instance, at the moment, that very much seem to play into a Polish domestic, to a Polish domestic audience in a moment of fundamental crisis of Europe. I'm not so sure if that part of public diplomacy trying to kind of settle the balance between Poland and Germany is really... I mean, what's the gain of public diplomacy for international relations in the last 20 years? I can see that in the post-45 world order where apologies and forgiving certainly aided international reconciliation, but over the last 20 years, I don't see much positive effects of the return of history in foreign policies. So but I would like to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. So before uh, we'll pass the mic to uh, Rafał Rokulski, I would like to ask a follow-up question because I was also interested in this um, uh, border uh, which is not so clear between propaganda and public diplomacy on the one hand and on the other hand, how to assess whether the, the successes of your policy because we are mainly uh, speaking about uh, the sender, what is being sent to the audience, but then how to assess whether it's actually uh, we're um, gaining uh, uh, effects, whether our goals are fulfilled. Okay, uh, Director Rogulski. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much once more for the for the great um, speech. And uh, I, I, I would be interested in links between internal policy and um, public diplomacy. Actually, in 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 both sides, uh, and eventually, uh, and possibly uh, influences, uh, um, especially influence uh, from uh, public diplomacy on internal, uh, let's say, historical dialogue and historical narratives. Thank you. I guess that's enough for another lecture. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, s luckily, uh, some elements uh, are the same in some questions, so I will try to uh, just to to find the, uh, the elements which link the questions, and I will squeeze it into some answers. Uh, the success in public diplom diplomacy. What is the success in public diplomacy and what are the 
failures um, in public diplomacy and politics of uh, memory and how to measure it and how do we know if it is a success or not. Uh, it's actually closely linked, in my opinion, to the idea also of the differences between uh, new public diplomacy and propaganda and to the inclusion also of the domestic level of uh, public diplomacy. Uh, of course, I share your opinion that what has been happening in the last years uh, in Polish politics of memory uh, brought more catastrophe than uh, positive effects, and I think I expressed it also clearly enough uh, in my talk, especially this uh, amendment of the law of uh, Institute of National Remembrance, which was actually done against um, not only all the ideas of public diplomacy and nation branding, but uh, well, we know also from the other sources that uh, the effects which might have been achieved and were achieved were uh, obvious um, also to, to, to politicians who prepared the, this law. Uh, in such a case, uh, although, uh, public diplomacy is not able to um, to introduce or to react very quickly because it is not public diplomacy or politics of memory which was responsible for uh, this amendment of the law, I think. Because we have also many uh, uh, other reasons why this law was implemented. Mm, and, well, public diplomacy works as uh, I can compare it to public relations when you want to sell a product you have also some people from public relations and they will help you to wrap it uh, to present the main messages so that it's understandable what the product is for I'm talking about public relations because many people from public relations have enormous impact on the ways how the states conduct public diplomacy and even politics of memory uh, I would say that if they have too much impact, then uh, it can result in no success. Because uh, politi uh, politics of memory, of course, should be also wrapped, and it's wrapped by a public, of public diplomacy and uh, nation branding. Uh, but the core belongs to the politicians. So we could not put all the blame on public diplomacy and nation branding uh, because of the failures of... Um, public diplomacy based on history. I think all politicians know very well that it's a very sensitive field uh, when we speak about history in international relations um, and they use it and misuse it. What public diplomacy can do and should do is a long time process and this is also one of the differences between public diplomacy and propaganda. We can achieve success, but the success in implementing public diplomacy and basing it on history would be creating such a field in which we can speak about tensions which result from uh, clashes in the understanding of history. And it's extremely difficult and very, very painful. I wouldn't agree that we didn't achieve any success, for example, in Polish German relations in this respect. Uh, because if we remember the temperature of debates on the organization of expellees in the 90s, uh, then uh, usually the 90s were seen as a success because Poland and Germany was able, were, both countries were able to talk about it. And it is very often the first achievement of public diplomacy to create such spaces or places. They can be virtual, it can be on social media or in reality, like Krzyzowa, for example, foundation or this network, when people simply can express uh, their opinions and try to find the uh, field where, where, they can, where they can discuss uh, the failures also. Uh, actually, I published l last time an article about the um, role of public diplomacy and uh, German uh, foreign uh, cultural policy in uh, bilateral relations. and. You know, the article was published, uh, was uh, written before uh, the second phase of the war with Ukraine. And my idea was uh, now that we actually have to rethink the role of public diplomacy in Polish German relations. Uh, Polish German relations, by the way, were very often presented as a success uh, because the countries were able to build on or despite of the 20th century conflicts. Now we are back to the battles on memory and even to some media wars. And we know, of course, that there will be probably the next stage of any conflict because we are approaching elections in Poland and the German 
um, German politics will be used for internal purposes in Polish political communication for sure. What public diplomacy once again can do is suggest some long-term, long-time uh, activities, like think about textbook commission. Textbook commission, Polish-German one, celebrates 50 years of work this year. This is the problem of public diplomacy. Public diplomacy will not give you a tool which will resolve the problems resulting for, from history uh, in half a year. Politicians are rather not able to wait 50 years for the effects. <laughs> Even if we have the effects, like in the textbook commission, they can reject the textbook as not suiting their imagination about the history, and this is actually what happened uh, in the Polish case. So the fourth volume of the Polish-German textbook on history, seen as a success, by the way, winning international awards, will not be uh, used in Polish schools. Uh, it is not recommended by the Polish Ministry of Education. So it can be used, but it is not recommended by the Polish Ministry. So we have the 50 years efforts. I would say that these are the efforts of public diplomacy, and then one decision of a politician uh, which says we will not use the 50 years efforts. Of course, it's a bit discouraging for all the people who would like to engage in public diplomacy. And I, I'm going now to explain the differences between public diplomacy and propaganda, because this is one of the core discussions in the field. All the people who actually discuss international uh, public diplomacy from the perspective of international relations sooner or later have to express their opinion about the differences. So, well, uh, usually, you know, uh, the explanation goes back to the type of communication which public diplomacy and propaganda are. Both are forms of political communication, in this case external political communication, of course with domestic dimension. But the main difference is, and this is why we use uh, in the field the idea of new public diplomacy, that this is the public diplomacy is a symmetric form of communication which never ignores the interests, the opinions of the uh, partner which we call nowadays because of the impact of public relations we call the partner the stakeholder it says that uh, we see propaganda as a symmetric form of communication which uses manipulation intentionally to achieve the objectives of the sender and while not respecting the needs and the objectives of the receiver whereas public diplomacy has to respect the ideas, the objectives, and the uh, the situation of the receiver, and should not assume any coercion, any force, because the messages can be also coercion, actually. And this is the main difference. Of course, it would be very easy to say, now we have the two definitions, and please uh, uh, divide uh, all the campaigns you know, and just classify them of like public diplomacy or propaganda, but we know that it depends also very much on the on the stakeholders, on the users or on the audiences. And well, in many cases, if we are not careful enough and if we not respect, uh, if we simply don't have enough knowledge about our potential partners, of course, uh, unconsciously, we can prepare a campaign of public diplomacy which will be decoded as propaganda. And we have many cases globally which present such campaigns which were decoded by the potential uh, receivers or I prefer the idea stakeholders because it makes them more active in the process which were decoded as propaganda, for example, because we were not listened to. This is why Polish people very often perceive German messages as propaganda because they have always had the idea they have not been listened to. So this uh, relations with Russia is only the, let's say, one of the examples which is very visible in international relations, but it goes bottom down. Um, it would work much better, I would say, on the local level. And yes, yesterday we had a good uh, illustration uh, by the colleague who was presenting about Koshalin. 
And for years we would say, once again, I focus now on the Polish-German relations, that the communication at the border region was much better between Poles and Germans than at the central level. It changes from time to time, but you know, the local authorities learned to cooperate, especially after 97, there was the huge flood at the time in the region, and since then at least the uh, communities on both sides of the border realize they have to cooperate because otherwise they, will, they, they would have too much water simply <laughs> everywhere. Uh, what I hear now is that the uh, tensions at the central level are also reflected uh, in the cooperation existing or not existing at the border level. However, I would say also that this good communication at the border level was enabled to a much extent also thank to the many uh, to the much of financial support uh, from the many European programs and there is, uh, I think it's a very relevant element of the uh, you know building the platform for the good cooperation on the border so the communities where the local authorities had some money to spend together they had simply to communicate <laughs> otherwise they would lose on both on both sides of course, we can expect that new public diplomacy would also enable the people to communicate via social media. Uh, and it changes, of course, the understanding of public diplomacy because we can uh, understand now how many opportunities social media create for communication between people. But I tried to analyze it on the case of 2014 uh, on one of the cases of cultural diplomacy and I observed that uh, cultural public diplomats are not as active on social media as they could be. And I observed also some bottom-up uh, cases like the participation of uh, citizens in some EU alliances. And they were rather like uh, um, pushing their own messages uh, in the meaning of conflict with uh, uh, foreign audiences than in any meaning of searching a solution for the conflict. So, frankly speaking, uh, public and cultural diplomacy is very good at informing about events, pushing information in an asymmetric way on social media, than on using the opportunities social media create. So, the opportunities are there, but uh, I don't observe any significant uh, effect which would be achieved thanks to social media and public and cultural diplomacy and also in politics of memory. And of course there is this internal dimension uh, which you mentioned. And some systems, uh, some uh, public diplomacy uh, institutions create uh, even some um, initiatives for the domestic level because public diplomacy and also politics of memory have of course the domestic dimension. Um, and it's extremely uh, relevant because if uh, the main messages the country sends abroad, also these messages which are based on history, um, are not in line with the uh, opinions of the people or if they are not uh, uh, representing the diversity of the people, then they might be decoded as false by the people themselves. And this is actually what happens in many countries, also in Poland nowadays, because many people simply do not, do not identify with the messages sent abroad uh, by the official uh, sources of public and cultural diplomacy. However, I would also um, say that Polish public and cultural diplomacy achieved some successes, but mainly uh, I observed it uh, between 2011 and 2015, but it achieved the success when it was based mainly on the success of Polish economy, not because of politics of memory as the core element of public diplomacy. So the main problem of the countries like Poland is, however, not that they are negatively perceived internationally, but the problem is that they are practically not visible at all and nobody cares about the countries. And it pushed, by the way, the countries like uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, but also Poland, to invest more in public and cultural diplomacy and to involve information about history into, into the campaigns on public and cultural diplomacy. Because the first task was to inform the international community that they simply exist. To 
uh, learn the international community that there are countries like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And it's very useful now because, you know, at least the people know that some of them border, uh, have a big neighbor on the east. Uh, it was done, by the way, for the purposes of a security. So if they implemented nation branding and also told about history in the nation branding, it was done because of the objectives of a security policy. Nobody would care if the person wouldn't know that, for example, Poland is close to Ukraine and to, to Russia, and the same about um, Baltic states, which, by the way, according to the branding campaigns, they don't want to be called Baltic states, but uh, Nordic states. It's one of the ideas of a nation, nation branding. So there was a success story, and it was even reflected in the indexes. Poland was much better perceived about 2011 and 20, between 2011 and 2015, but mainly because of the huge improvement and huge development of Polish economy. And if you want to see how it was reflected in indexes, there is, for example, Global Presence Index done by one Spanish think tank, uh, Elcano Institute, and they produce a Global Presence Index, which shows how much the economic, the hard, and the soft power contributes to the perception of the country. And in the Polish case, it's the economy which contributes the most to the visibility of the country internationally. In the Russian case, it's the military power, but this is the data from 2021. The data from 22 is not there. It's, by the way, very interesting how it will change. For Germany, it's also uh, economy. For Ukraine, it used to be soft power, by the way. One of the exceptions in the region where the soft power contributed the, the most to the visibility of the country and to its, global, to its global presence. So, of course, we can measure to some extent if public diplomacy is successful, but it's much more difficult to measure if, public, if uh, politics of memory within public diplomacy is successful. Because if you want to measure it, you have to firstly uh, create the criteria. And I wouldn't expect any changes in the political culture of the receiving countries or the target countries. I would see a success in more knowledge about what was going on in the other region of the world. And that was the main problem of Central and Eastern Europe. This was the main reason to introduce politics of memory into the public and cultural diplomacy. No knowledge about about the history, and I think that Ukraine uh, will also intensify their efforts, they will have to do the same. Because the current conflict also showed that the people, even in Europe, didn't know completely, um, not completely, didn't know much, I would say, about uh, the history of Ukraine. And the problem was, of course, that they saw Ukraine through the historical narratives of Russia. And it made also the countries like Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, also Ukraine, to implement politics of memory into the public and cultural diplomacy, because they knew that they had to compete with the Russian narrative of the 20th century, which dominated definitely before 1989. And of course, there are many failures in this politics of memory, but I, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine served here as a test, unfortunately, because the war happened. And it probably in the next years we will be able to state that it was not public and cultural diplomacy, but the war in Ukraine which contributed to and which allowed to achieve some of the objectives of politics of memory of this region and public and cultural diplomacy of the region. And it's devastating to any soft power concepts, as you can imagine. But not only this concept was devastated this year, but also, for example, the famous complex interdependence saying that Handel durch Wandel will bring the countries closer. 
Okay, thank you very much. Unless there is a very pressing question, I would like to uh, end up this session. Um, we will for sure learn more about um, the beginnings of the Ukrainian cultural diplomacy today from Tina Perasunko, which is a very good example for us today as well. So uh, please stay with us also later. Thank you very much, Professor, for the wonderful lecture and welcome to the break.